So good evening, folks. My name is Alan Story from the group Get PR Done. We are a cross-party group uh, or no party. We have one objective, which is to try and win pro proportional representational voting in this country. And the tactic is, first of all, win over the Labour Party. Once we win over the Labour Party, it dramatically changes the balance of power on this issue, because then it would be all the parties against the Conservative Party. And there are lots of Tories who are also in support of PR. But when we're still at the present moment, it's two big parties against PR and all the other parties in favor of it. You can never win any kind of war like that. So we have to bring Labour on side and convince them that if they are a party uh, of fairness and a party that uh, really wants to win a next election, that PR is a good platform to work on. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, and we have our guest tonight is uh, Dr. Jessica, but she likes to be called Jess Garland. She is the uh, Director of Policy and Research at the Electoral Reform Society, a society which was formed a long, long time ago for electoral reform. And um, she's a person who, uh, she's not, she doesn't sort of send out the emails and see all that kind of stuff. She's the one who works on policy and research, a really important uh, job. And, you know, she has a, a, a PhD in politics in the University of Sussex holds a research degree. She's very well qualified. And we just know that someone who knows what they're talking about. And so the person then, we also think it's it's not, it's hard for, for Jess or anybody to speak for half an hour uh, by themselves. So it tends to work better for in fact, having someone to interview that person. And the person who's interviewing Jess will be my colleague, Ian Glenister, a member of the Labour Party. And he is the uh, co-editor with me of the uh, Get PR Done blog called uh, originally In Proportion. And uh, so it's over to you, Ian, to start asking the questions. Start your questions, please come in on the chat line. Keep your microphones muted. And then when I recognize you, then you can, I'll say, as a mic, you can turn on your microphone, ask your question. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Alan. Great introduction as ever, um, uh, th and welcome, Jess. And thank you for, for spending time with us tonight. Um, first, before we begin with the questions, can you give us an outline of what you at the ERS, what do you do at the ERS, what the ERS does, the Electoral Reform Society? So what, what do you do there? Sure. Well, I'm not sure I can hugely improve on that fabulous introduction, but um, ERS, yes, has been around for over 100 years, trying to get PR done, um, like you guys. And um, yeah, my, my role there is in, in policy and research. So I am sort of chief politics nerd and um, we crunch the numbers. We d d do, you know, um, testing of public opinion. Um, and all the sort of put it, putting all the structures in behind behind the campaign to to try and convince people um, okay. towards PR. Good, good. So, okay, so Britain is often called the uh, the mother of all parliaments, right? And I always, when I was growing up, I always thought Britain was a kind of a model democracy. I was always thought this is a fantastic place. We voted, we got the party we voted for. What is wrong with our system? What, what do you think at the ERS? What do you what do you think is wrong with it? Yeah, and I think that, that that that's one of the issues, isn't it? That people sort of grow up thinking, well, this is the way of doing things. And actually, it's not the only way of doing things. And I think that's increasingly coming clear. I think the, the wheels are really falling off the way our democracy is structured because people are voting differently, because society's changed. Um, we don't have a two party system anymore. We're in a, we've got a multi party uh, system trying to squeeze through a two party electoral system. But I don't think it. I don't think it ends at the electoral system itself because it's actually the, the, the structures of politics that you get that that electoral system creates. So, you know, majoritarian system, it's designed to exclude the minority view. Um, it's designed to create single party governments that can kind of steamroll through whatever they want. That's, that's one of the things that First Post Post is, you know, one of the, the selling points. But I think what we're trying to show is that you, when you look at the sort of culture that that creates and when you look at the outcomes that, that deliver, that that is really not satisfactory for people. You know, the, mm. we've got a system that's really kind of um, forcing stuff through in, in a way that now feels very artificial and doesn't really represent where people are at. 
Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things you said, it's a two-party system, but but those parties have to adapt and swell and, and encompass quite a large ideology, don't they? We haven't seen the struggles in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party over, over Brexit as well. So that's that's something that a more plural system, that's the right, or proportional system should encourage, I suppose, a more, more diversity of parties and views. Do you agree yeah, with that? And it can it can do, and, and, it, and it often does lead to, to more multi, multi-partyism. I think where we're seeing the, the cracks appearing at the moment is because we're trying to squeeze this sort of multi-party uh, United Kingdom into the two-party system, that it's creating lots of very unusual and odd results that you know are becoming a lot more disproportional. And I think for me, 2015 was really the election that kind of really broke through be, being the worst for, for how badly the system was translating people's votes into seats. I mean, looking at you know huge numbers of people voting for parties other than the biggest two in that election, hugely disproportional result um, as, as a result of it. And also one of the interesting things, I think thinking about the UK and with the future of the UK is that for the first time in that election as well, we had different parties um, in power in each of the different nations. And I think that really mm. creates a bigger problem of kind of exaggerating our political differences across the UK um, and, and, and really sort of creating artificial divides. Well, that's a good point, actually. That's not one of the list of questions I was going to ask, but there is an experience on our doorstep in Wales and uh, and in Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, where they have, um, I'm not sure exactly what specific system they, they, they have to elect their individual parliaments, but can we learn from their experience? Are they, have their experiences been positive? Yeah, well, in, in the devolved parliaments, absolutely completely different type of politics going on there. AMS using both those systems, slightly different variations, um, of course. But, you know, to just take a look at the recent Scottish election. You know, the SNP on the, the constituency seats, you know, would have absolutely stormed it. But the top up list changed, changed that dynamic in a way that represented the views across Scotland you know, much more accurately in what was a very important election for the future of Scotland and, and for representing people's opinions properly. And actually, it just gives me a small opportunity to plug a report we're releasing this weekend, um, which is looking at the sort of two decades it's been now of PR systems in, in Wales and Scotland um, and London, um, and just looking how different, how different the results are there compared with um, results at Westminster. And mm-hmm. I think it's a really stark difference in, in terms of um, how views are represented. And of course, you don't have this sense of, well, everyone's voting the same way in this part of the country, which is clearly not the case, but that's how artificially it looks. Yeah, and I think a similar thing has happened in New Zealand with uh, when they transitioned to PR back in the 90s. People are getting more engaged now, whereas before it was a, it was a two-party state effectively, usually white middle-aged men <laughs> ruling the roost, one party or the other, fairly, fairly closely economically aligned, relatively speaking. And now it's different and people, uh, the New Zealand parliament actually looks like the people of New Zealand. There's ethnic diversity and all, and 50% women, which is fantastic. Yeah, and absolutely, you look at, you just, just the representatives themselves have changed dramatically, as you say, but also, you know, I think New Zealand is a brilliant example because this is somewhere which, you know, had a similar model and managed to move to something much more grown up and then got a much better version of politics um, at the end of it. So, you know, this is this is a really good case study mm. of, of how to of how to change things and actually that things can change, that we're not stuck in one way of doing things. Exactly. Well, we, we're here to talk about some specifics of first class proposed as well and where, where the problems lie. Um, and one of the things that I know you're interested in particular is, is the idea of the wasted vote. So in, in uh, proportional systems, every vote counts. You can vote for who you want uh, and you, you can get who you want if there's enough of you want that particular party. But in first part of the post, it doesn't quite work that way, does it? No, and we, we talk about wasted votes. Um, in a way, you know, mo- no, no one wants to feel that their vote is wasted. And indeed, of course, just turning up is, is important in itself. But we, we calculate this thing, what we, sh- we call wasted votes, just to show how inefficient first past the post can be. So um, what we would call a wasted vote is either a vote that's gone to a candidate that lost, that didn't get across the line, or f- uh, plus votes to a candidate over and above what they needed. Mm-hmm. And, and this really highlights, it's going back to what you said at the beginning, people are used to used to kind of first past the post as a system. And so why, why we calculate wasted votes is to show actually how things could be different. And of course, 
you know, if you take a constituency, many constituencies, um, particularly in the Northwest, actually, have these huge majorities. So the winning candidate is getting like 70% of the vote. And that's fantastic for them. But actually for their party and their voters, that's really, really inefficient. And if you think if that was a, a, a multi-member constituency that you might have a PR system for, if you're getting two thirds of the vote, then you'd get two thirds of the representatives. Whereas at the moment for that party, all those other votes just don't really count towards the outcome. Um, and then, of course, if you in, in terms of the losing candidate votes, you know, if you're in a preferential system, then mm -hmm. your vote's going to, you know, carry on to to another your second preference or yes. what have you. Same with with a list system. You've got to top up. So essentially what we're saying is the inefficiency of the system means that you know, like 70 percent of the votes are not directly contributing to the outcome. That was 70 percent last election, yeah. 2017, about 68 percent. So they're not having an impact. And, and it sounds very technical, but it's kind of a way of just showing, you know, this is inefficient and it's not giving voters very much of what they wanted. Wow, that's, that's an incredible number, isn't it? So <laughs> over two thirds of the population's vote is kind of irrelevant almost, you could say. Yeah, yeah. And, and we actually found, I think it was 2017, yeah, 2017, where we found that there was some, because the, because the election hang, hung on so many like marginal, very small margins, there mm -hmm. was like 533 votes could have swung the actual outcome. You know, when yeah. you think of how many people are voting, that's incredible, isn't it? It's, it, it, it comes down to such small margins for just so, so few people. Yeah, and on election night, we always look to these marginal seats, don't we? And as soon as one one falls one way or the other, we can sort of predict perhaps the way the country's going to go, I, I guess. And that makes it very exciting, though, doesn't it? <laughs> In a way. It does. It's like, it, it, I mean, yeah, election night, I'm sure we're all up late. And, it, it, you know, it is the World Cup for mm. politics geeks, isn't it? And I, you know, and I am one and I love it. But I think I would probably trade in that one night of excitement for mm. sort of 365 days of grown up politics, yeah. you know, because it and I also think that sort of like it's the way it's presented is always kind of like focus on the marginal seats, of course, focusing on always on the big scalps, you know, big names, you know, lost lost their seat. And again, 2017 was really interesting for that because there were some big names, weren't there, who, who lost their seats. And there was a lot of focus on that. And I think the overall impression was, wow, this was really, you know, dynamic kind of changeable election and actually lowest number ever of seats actually changed not ever but look for a long time it's like 70 seats changed party hands out of 650 so this wasn't a great big shift in in the political dynamic and I think because we're so used to focusing on those marginal seats we feel like that's where the elections are and actually for a lot of people as we know are in safe seats where you know yeah. they might never have they might never have had a different party elected. Do you think these the MPs represented in these uh, safe seats. Um, do you think they are blockers to electoral reform themselves? Or have you have any idea whether they support PR or are they against it? What do you think? You know, I haven't matched up the safeness of a seat with the support for PR, but my inclination would be actually it's more driven by partisan um, okay. preferences than that and, and I, I suppose one example would be the SNP who are one of the biggest you know kind of beneficiaries of, of first past post at Westminster I mean they got 81 percent of the seats on 40 something percent of the vote in 2019 but they remain committed to PR and I think that's really commendable but also I think it shows you know once you've got a policy towards a better system that that, that that's really what's shaping those opinions but having said that, I do think you see MPs who have had experience of being in a kind of democratic desert for their party do also have a more nuanced view. So, you know, Labour MPs in the South can see that, you know, the seats there aren't matching where they know support is. Similarly, mm. Conservatives in Scotland, you know, like the PR systems there have kept them in in power in seats you know whereas they would have been wiped out otherwise so I think there's there is definitely a nuance on opinion and I don't think it is just all kind of um self-interestedly based yeah. but but I as I say I don't know I haven't matched up it's an interesting well, that was a stunning statistic I think that um, your group uh, released was the number of votes required per MP of various various colors and the SNP came out I think it was only 20,000 or so required to get an SNP 50,000 for Labour, I think, and only 38,000 for the Tories. That's quite a discrepancy, isn't it? Yeah, and 800 
yeah. something thousand for yeah, the Greens, green. um, one one MP. So, you know, this is first past post all over, isn't it? It's if you're geographically concentrated, um, your party support is geographically concentrated, and you know you've got smaller numbers of voters, then you you know it, it works in your favour, and that's why we have all these sort of quite random what technically called electoral biases in the system um because you know it it depends you know where your voters are and it shouldn't yeah. really <laughs> yeah exactly and the other the other aspect of of british politics is with with a two-party system essentially anybody who doesn't favor uh either of those two parties is probably not going to vote at all and so there's the the did not vote category how important do you think that is and and what do you think that 40% or so, or 30%, what, what, who do they represent? Who's represented in that section of society? That's really interesting, because I think people always want to feel like, you know, if you, th those people started voting, then they'd vote for one party or another. But I, I think for, for non-voters, you know, part-time preference where it exists is sort of similarly distributed to, to how it is in the rest of the population. But I think, I think there's a... a there is a question of why people aren't voting and there's huge numbers of reasons but if you are you know in one of those seats that's never changed party hands you know and, and our data showing you know like before the last election like 30 percent of seats haven't changed party since 1945 you know if you are a voter not of that party in that seat i mean how many elections are you going to go and sort of <laughs> cast your vote and i think i think there might be a, a generational shift here as well you know people often vote out of a sense of civic duty you know like even if they think it's not going to count it's something they do it's part of being a, in a democratic society and i do wonder if that is starting to shift and actually like civic, that 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 automatic reaction of i'm just going to vote anyway even if it doesn't you know count is actually weakening a little bit right that's so where we can see problems the post post war generation um what i call the gray vote <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the post-war generation, they fought for democracy in a way, and they they damn well going to make it down to the uh, the polling station in their bath chairs or whatever, and, and put their cross, whether you know whether their MP is is or their choice will never get in or not. So they're, they're exercising their democratic right. I think people are a bit more cynical now, aren't they? Mm, I think I'm. Um, I will say that the last you know a couple of decades in politics are characterized by all the d's you know it's disappointment yeah. disaffection discontent um disappointment i think being the, the biggest one and 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 all of those things are really working against politics at the moment and it is that sense of you know i do think we've got to give people something better to mm -hmm. engage in rather than just yeah. expect people to engage yeah and the other the tactic that people who perhaps are engaged but they know they've got absolutely no that their, their, their first choice would have no chance of winning is the tactical vote so they might vote for the second place candidate anything basically to get to get rid of the guy they hate or woman they hate the most what's the significance do you think of tactical voting let's say in the last election or, or the one before oh i think it's huge and i think it's getting bigger as well um we we in the run-up to elections have been polling people on whether they're likely to cast a tactical vote or not and in 2017 it was like one in five um in the run up to 2019, as the sort of campaign was going on, it was uh, one in four. And then and then afterwards, um, we found it was one in three okay. had said we I cast a tactical vote in that election. And actually, you can see a little bit of the sort of um, of that squeeze going on in terms of party support. So at the beginning of that year, you know, the two biggest parties between them were on like 50 percent mm -hmm. in the polling. By the time the election came around, that was up to 75%. So you can see that sort of two-party squeeze where people are saying, well, I've actually got to vote for one of these parties to make it count. And yeah. obviously coupled with um, the tactical vote. And actually, if you look at some of the results, you can see, well, actually, that looks like, you know, tactical voting might have made a difference there. And again, mm. you know, nothing wrong with people casting votes on whatever basis they want to. Um, but it would be nice if it, you know, that people felt that... that a tactical vote is a negative thing, isn't it? As you as you spell it out, it's kind yeah. of it's against something rather than for something, and I do think that that sort of is an un unsustainable way of going about things. You know, saying to people, well, you know, that's not what you want, but have this instead. You know, people yeah. are used to having better choice than that in all other aspects of their life.
it seems to be totally against the natural order of things in a democracy to vote for the person that you don't, don't really want, but it's better than the person that you think you might get in anyway. So there's something wrong about it. Somebody's just posted on the chat, I'm going to mention it, um, that there are 9 million eligible voters who, who don't even bother registering. I mean, that's, a, that's terrible in a democracy outside, isn't it? It is. Uh, it's absolutely scandalous that there's so many people unregistered. And, and this is an issue of, of how the system's working. There are so many things you could do that are really easy and straightforward. And even the Electoral Commission have kind of scoped out how to do them. Um, and and we, shouldn't have, we shouldn't have people not registered. When in so many other countries that happens automatically, you know, if you're paying tax, you're registered to vote. Classic relationship between having yeah. a say and paying tax. Um, you know, and, and there's so many ways you can make that more automatic and, and just get people. It's the first step, isn't it? Um, mm. What worries me is that the people who aren't registered, that's not evenly distributed across society. So it's more likely to be um, younger people and people who are moving house more frequently. You know, it doesn't affect people, people equally. And, and so that's already mm. a kind of inequality built into the system and, and actually think, sorry sorry <laughs> i'm on my hobby horse no but when, when it comes to sort of when we talk going back to what i was saying about majorities and unearned majorities at the beginning you know when you take into account the people who aren't registered and then the people who are registered but haven't voted and then you take into account that you can get a huge majority of seats on less than a majority of the vote yeah. suddenly you've got actually a really small proportion of, of of the country choosing a government who then have complete power with very little kind of opposition and and yeah. I think that's just that's the whole system that it just it feels so wrong it's going back to fifth century Athens or something it's, it's, it doesn't feel right and also what do you think uh, of the government's plan to make ID voter ID compulsory how do you think that will pan out how will that affect voting well I think it's wrong for a start we We've got plenty of examples from the states of how discriminatory it can be. Um, and obviously, you know, there's no proven need for it either. Um, and, and just a shame to be focusing on, on that when there's so many other issues that could be could be dealt with. And the election bill, which has just been introduced to Parliament, has a whole range of measures. And I, we're here to talk about PR, so I don't want to take up all the airspace with that. But really worrying developments. Um, to do with the independence of our electoral commission and various things i mean mm. that feels like it's going very much in the wrong direction um mm. as you say if people aren't registered we should be really focusing on getting more people to the polls than than trying to make it harder for people who who you know who do okay so okay going back to the potential pr issue so if we uh one, one of the possible pr methods would still involve constituencies um, I think, for example, the system they use in Germany and in New Zealand, the MNP system, still have the constituencies. Um, that leads to the question about potential gerrymandering and, and massaging the boundaries. At the moment, the government is going through uh, a process through the Boundary Commission of, of altering boundaries. Now, I can see why they're doing that. They're trying to make the, the, constitu uh, the constituencies roughly the same at 70, 75,000 people. That's probably a good thing. Do you think there's going to be a political effect of the current proposals? I think we'll certainly we'll certainly see a shift in some of those some of those seats. I'm not convinced it's going to be huge. Um, there's some recent research out which shows that the the constituencies that are increasing their voter weight, as it were, um, are m more safe. Of the safe seats are increasing, and the, with the marginal seats, they're actually losing voter weight. So. It, Hard to see that's going to play out um, in each of the constituencies, and I'm sure there's people in all the parties really doing that um, detailed work. And as you say, there's nothing inherently wrong in kind of equalising constituency sizes. Um, we always felt that the limitations on it were too small. You know, it, you'd have a lot less churn if you had a little bit more flex in in the size thing. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think this this. Uh, the boundary changing, you know, we are lucky to have a boundaries commission that is kind of looking at this independently, whereas in the states, redistricting, as it's called there, is, is used for partisan reasons. Um, and there was historically uh, kind of that there have been, there are electoral biases in the system. This is the problem with first past the post yeah. again, you know, we're changing the boundaries rather than changing the system which creates the bias in the first place. But um, there's different types of electoral bias and, and they have over time kind of worked in different parties' favours. Um, 
but you know this is what this is kind of deck chair moving do you know what I mean? it's tinkering yeah. around the edges mm. um and actually whilst you still have the kind of safe seats and the marginal seats you know you haven't dealt with the, the main issue but i'm i'm not sure at the moment how big an issue how big a change we're going to see um and and of course I mean, it wasn't just 2019, these these changes have been coming along the track, but we've actually seen quite a big shift in the balance of constituencies between Labour and the Tories, the fall of the Red Wall, for instance. Mm. I mean, those seats were sort of working in Labour's favour in terms of smaller, lower turnout. These are other things that um, affect um, electoral outcomes. Okay. Now that that's shifted, I'm not sure that this sort of constituency equalisation is going to work quite the same as it would have done sort of in, you know, two elections ago. So mm. I think it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But at the moment, looking at the data, I don't think it's going to be ginormous. OK, OK. Well, I mean, um, 100 marginal constituencies tip the balance every time. Um, so we've actually, if I'm going back to what we've already talked about in a way, but we've, we've talked about wasted votes, the, the, the marginal constituencies being the battle lines, the safe seats option. There is really nothing much in favour of PR now. It's probably served its course, uh, of the first past opposed, it served its purpose, I suppose, when there was a two party system 100 years ago or, or more. Now it's no longer relevant with a more diverse you know, population. Um, so we can look at possible solutions. We've talked about proportional representation. Um, and at some point, uh, we, yourself, your organisation, get PR done, and we're going to have to probably land on something um, that we can try and progress amongst, amongst people and actually try to promote. Does the Electoral Reform Society have a specific one that they want to, they think is fairer than all the others, and why? Yeah. We really like single transferable vote but that is used um local elections in in scotland for a whole variety of reasons you know it, it more people get more of what they want essentially i don't I won't go into the huge amounts of detail but it is also um a system where you you have a constituency and what we hear from mps quite a lot is well what about the constituency link mm. um and so that's quite an in, important part of it um and you know it is you know the, the, the way the vote's distributed is, is really, as I say, the easiest way I can explain it is more people get more of what they want. But um, I think also, you know, we are sort of, we're in a position now where we really have to sell the idea of change first before the kind of the, the solution. And, and, and I think that's, it's both important to kind of like open up the conversation about it being different, but also, you know, not just the nature of the system, but what are the outcomes? You know, what, what's different for you as someone under a PR system? Not just how your vote translates into seats, but what's what's the difference you're going to get? And kind mm -hmm. of going back to what we were saying at the beginning, how a whole culture of politics could be different under a different system. And I think that's what, what we need to really engage people in. Absolutely. And I think the media and the vested interests are going to move heaven, heaven and earth to stop that from happening. Those are, it's a huge... Uh, mountain to climb but in New Zealand they've managed to do it so uh, I think we, it's going to be a much tougher ask over here um, but one of the things that struck me when I was talking to a guy called Phil Saxby he was on the electoral commission in, in New Zealand and he helped me sort of um, with some questions on this blog I'm writing is that part of what they did was they promoted it amongst uh, the population sold it as a, a way of topping up they called it topping up votes so and I thought that was quite interesting. So in other words, you could just explain it to people that um, MMP, which is a system that they use, or, or single transferable vote, whichever one we land on, is just a way of topping up this constituency vote. You keep the constituencies, you vote as normal, but just to make it fairer, you add a load of votes in and, and a load of MPs in as a result of that. Is that a way to go to think, to, to explain to people, to make it very simple that they can understand? Yeah, I mean, I think there's different ways. I, I think a really fruitful way of going about this is, is like in British Columbia where you know there was citizens assembly looking at this issue and actually you know New Zealand did it via referendum but I think 
if you've got a group of people who have the time and are given the resources to kind of go through the options um, and see what they think would be best and then present that and say that you know we're a representative sample of citizens and we've not me not me saying to people you should have this system but actually you know ordinary people getting together and saying right we're going to go through all the different systems look at the pros and cons and and, and come up with something that we think's the right the right thing for this particular situation because of course different systems, different parliaments, different levels of government, you know, there's lots of things to factor in. I think that has a lot of power. And although, you know, it didn't get across the line in British Columbia because of the referendum requirements, you know, to have a citizen voice saying, this is yeah. what we what we think is right, you know, it has a lot of power. Yeah. We've, there's a lot of chat on, on uh, Get PR Done uh, about using citizens assemblies to do justice. We haven't got much of a history of that in this country, though, have we, of, of this kind of democracy? No, but it is growing massively. Um, you know, we've, lots of councils have had citizen assemblies on their transport plans. There's been a climate assembly, citizen assembly on the future of Scotland, you know, lots in Ireland um, and Northern Ireland. And, and I think, you know, I start, first started looking at this issue about eight years ago and people would say, uh, uh, what now? You know, and, and you had to explain it. And, and now you say citizens assembly and people sort of nod along. And I, I think that uh, that's just an, my experience. But I think people are more alive to this as an idea. And the more these things happen and the more people take part in them. Um, so, no, you're right. There isn't a history of it. In some way, that's quite nice. You know, we've got a lot of we're weighed down by a lot of history of our mother of all parliaments, as you said at the beginning. And I think I think having something new that, that people can engage in is, is actually it's a good thing. OK, I was just worried that people may be engaged in many things, but, but changing the electoral system isn't one of them. We saw in the 2011 referendum, admittedly, the choice wasn't great. And I guess that contributed towards the apathy there. But uh, what, what was it, a 40 percent turnout and, you know, whatever? <laughs> How do we get enough people engaged or will we be satisfied with? a couple of dozen citizens assemblies coming up with ideas on behalf of the people that don't turn up to those assemblies. I don't know. How will that pan out, do you think? Yeah, I mean, from, from you know, the evidence of the um, citizens assemblies that have taken place, you know, look at the one in Ireland on constitutional issues. Some of those issues were topical, some of them weren't, you know, and, and that's where a citizen assembly really can add value because it doesn't have to be it, there's there's always a learning phase so you're not expecting anyone to come already knowing about the subject um they're really good for looking at very technical things they're really good looking at things that need a lot of considered thought outside of the noise of a referendum campaign which inevitably are never about the subject matter you know the campaign is never about the actual subject matter of the referendum and so you know to take that sort of political heat out of it um mm. and give people the space to kind of discuss these things um you know amongst themselves with experts um and also i do think there is you know when it comes to a, you know often the citizen assembly happens first and then there's a referendum afterwards and and you know i do think having that pre-process is very um very important because it informs that referendum debate in a way that if you just throw the question out there it really doesn't okay i was going to say then you seem to be coming down on the side of uh, maybe the citizens assembly let's call them feeding into a government already mandated to change the system, but now you're saying feeding into a government already mandated to change the system, but then they will put that to a vote, put that to a referendum. Do you think that's a good idea rather than just saying uh, at a general election, a party standing on the platform of changing it and, and actually enacting a change? No, I mean, I think you've got to have political commitment, but you have to have political commitment even if you going into a, a citizens assembly process because the most damaging thing is to have those processes and then the government to go actually thanks for that but we'll just file that away in a drawer for future mm -hmm. um so i yeah i agree with you like political commitment first up and the party wants to come in and, and change the electoral system without any public involvement also fine but you know having that sort of public support is a ballast um when it comes to the type of system again you know that 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 is a good way of, of getting there but i think you you know you say there's lots of different routes of getting there um okay. and there's not one one perfect one i don't think speaking personally i think i've had enough of referendums but you know, they are yeah. an important way of of giving something the seal of approval 
Okay, um, we're going to we're very near the end of time now. But one of the questions I had right at the bottom was was more directed towards uh, us at G Get PR Done. Uh, there's you. There's the Labour for a New Democracy. There's, there's a plethora, Make Votes Matter, of groups. Um, how do you see us working together, if at all? Do you see there's a different role for each of the groups? Um, what can we do to improve what we're doing? Do you know what? I, I, I think one of the great things that I've seen from my time in, in the democracy sector is just its growth. You know, it, it's, it's, there's loads of groups now working towards similar aims and talking to each other and, 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 and you know, making sure we align and we know what each other are doing. And, and that takes time and skill and, and all the rest of it. But it is really um, very healthy and I think a really good way you know, going back to what we we're saying right at the start about how difficult it is to um, sometimes explain the complexities, how how you know how big a challenge this is. Yeah. Um, you know, strength in numbers, I think, is is really valuable, and I think you know all the different groups that you know we work with are, are bringing something different to the table, mm -hmm. talking to different parties, doing it in different ways, um, and I think that's that's really healthy, and that makes me quite hopeful for the future. Good. So I'd like to end on an on a optimistic note. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for your, um, for your time. You. We've got some more questions, I think, coming uh, your way. So Alan, I'll hand over to you now. I think you're on mute, Alan. Hey, I'm just now, right. Okay. So we're going to now start going through the questions in some kind of order. Uh, the one thing is, uh, everybody, please keep their mute, their microphone muted until I say, Fred, ask a question. Then you, in fact, unmute yourself because this gets very echoey. So the first question it was actually the first one that was asked by Radev, or oh, sorry, Padev, Padev, about how to engage with average folks. Are you there, Padev? I I am here. Yes. Great. Ask your question. Uh, really, as I say, it's just uh, the perennial challenge, the challenge that all of us who are passionate about uh, constitutional reform and electoral reform in, in general, um, how do we get ordinary Joe public on our side? Because realistically, it's only through the massive groundswell of public support behind us that we can hope to overcome uh, the intransigence of, you know, of the labservative uh, duopoly who, who, who are, have a, a massive self-interest in maintaining the current system. Um, so it, any, any constructive and creative suggestions that the, the panellists and experts in this have? Uh, I mean, I, I remember listening to uh, John Curtis, Professor John Curtis, quite recently in, uh, in another Zoom meeting. And his words of wisdom rang very true. He, he said that essentially what we need to do is not try to sell PR or the merits of a PR system, because really we're just talking to the converted there. Um, essentially what he said in a nutshell is do a hatchet job on first past the post to demonstrate to the mass of ordinary citizens why first past the post doesn't work. Okay, thanks, Padov. Jess? Okay, sorry, I've gone on a bit. <laughs> no, that was really interesting. And I, I think that you're absolutely right that, that the starting point is to show that what, what exists isn't good enough and, and that there is like huge problems with it. Um, because if people haven't recognised that there's a problem, they're not going to be interested in the solution. Um, but I think taking that one step further, how do you get the mass of people involved and not just the politically interested so we know that people who support PR are way high up the scale on political interest than, than anyone else and you know that makes that makes sense but I think it's about connecting it to other things in people's lives so not just talking about the system but talking about the outcomes as I said earlier and and, and linking this in one of my biggest frustrations has always been um, I used to work in climate policy you know why are we at this situation where everyone knows that there's an emergency and nothing's happening um, and and it's that there is something about the particular short termism of our system, the way that po the policy seesaw, you know, it, it, there are 
actual outcomes and frustrations that people have with with things other than the system itself that are completely connected to the system and i think joining up those dots is is really important but i haven't got a really snappy way of doing that yet as you can tell from my very long-winded answer so you know working on it <laughs> okay yeah. next uh in yang you rosen you ask your devil's advocate question Skyrocketed, and he lived to see it, which of course, a lot of yeah. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, can this is a little bit of a devil's advocate question. Oh, hold on, just one second. Can, can am not... I am I am I unmuted? Yeah, you're no, but you're moving your mic, you're moving your camera around too much. Hold the camera steady, okay? Gotcha. Okay, so your... the, the, the premise is. If I'm in a constituency and the, 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 the candidates standing have all put their, put their, their, their policies forward and we all vote uh, on those local issues and my candidate comes out on top, but then a slew of votes from the neighboring constituency are drafted in, they're considered wasted votes from the neighboring constituency um, and they tip the balance in the favor of someone else in my constituency, how is that fair? How do we how do we square the circle on that one? I think it's very unlikely that that, that you would have a system that would would operate in that way. In in the sense that um, you know, if if your preferred candidate has got over the line, be that a kind of um, the quota of of a quota type system, or has won the constituency element of a of a top up system. Then, then they're already in, you know, they're in the bag. So it's 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 rare um, to kind of have results kind of twisted yeah. on the head. And you might get that with like SV, um, yeah. supplementary vote, but we you know which the Conservatives want to get rid of, but actually very few contests where one person's been leader has kind of switched over. So um, I think I think that that's sort of not likely to happen. Um, it, it, it's more a case of where people's votes haven't gone anywhere and someone hasn't got over the line that they've, right. they've got somewhere sure. to go to. That makes sense. But if, if I could follow up then, I think the fundamental point still stands though, that we would still be topping up a uh -huh. constituency with votes that were made for different candidates in a different area on different subjects. And I'm just wondering, how, that, are people going to buy that? Uh, and when it comes to um, top up lists, often that's done regionally. So, whereas in Scotland, it's regionally, so it is is still within the same same area um, and and same issues as well. Because we're talking about national parliaments there, so most people are voting on the national issues. Um, local government is where you know you would have a, a system that works for local government, so everyone's you know um, votes are within the area. Um, and again, STV works great in Scotland for local government. You know, you get really good balance in the councils and 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 lots of a really fair spread of, of the votes, which are on local issues. And what's important about that actually is, can you like, so few people going along for their local election who are actually voting on local manifestos. You know, so many people are just thinking kind of partisan terms. And actually, if you have a system that's more responsive and um, more reflective where people are, you know, you can bring things down to actually. The local issues which is essentially what you should be voting on it in in those contests so i do i do think there's you know things are still localized if i can sum it up like that okay stephen uh -huh. Cook, you have a question here about the constituency link what yeah, i take it you don't think too much of the constituency link under first past the post okay if you uh, uh, i'll just ask um Stephen's question for him. Isn't the constituency link under first past the post a bit of a nonsense because it's a national vote, not a local one? MPs often feign interest around the election with some glossy photos. I think the idea is that it's all portrayed as a sort of local election, local election, but in fact, it's actually not, it's a sort of a Stammer versus Johnson election. It's not really about local issues very much. What do you think about that, uh, Jess? Yeah, it's funny, it was sort of picking up on what I was just saying there, definitely at, at Westminster level, it's all about the leader of the party, or at least it's becoming more and more about the leader of the party in a kind of, um, what academics call a kind of Americanization. Um, and 
and yeah and that's that's interesting isn't it because but but then people do feel kind of like you know you always hear people say well mps are all rubbish but i like my mp you know so some, some people do have that kind of connection but I think when people talk about the constituents, it often comes from MPs themselves and they're like, well, you know, I know my area really well and, you know, this is where I, I represent. And, and they say, well, the list MPs are representing a whole region and, and how are they accountable to constituents. But, you know, it, it does work. I mean, people in Wales and Scotland would be better to, to explain how it is first person. But, you know, again, there's different ways of doing things and most systems have some kind of connection to an area. I mean, what people are sort of against really is that sort of just one big list for the whole country, but rarely any countries actually use that system. Okay, thanks, Jess. Now, Barry Edwards, your question about what someone once said in that PR debate online, that it's that PR is less democratic. Why do you ask your question? Thanks. Um, where are we? In a, yes, someone said to me, in debate, in some ways, a proportional system is less democratic because coalition governments have to be cobbled together after an election. So there can be um, long periods before a government has been formed, having no say in the platform agreed in the final coalition agreement. So I think he cites particularly Belgium in recent years. And also that the, as you end up with a cobbled together coalition, that you end up with a manifesto that no one actually voted for. That's really interesting. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating kind of area of conversation because I think what's really changed in recent years is we've had a coalition under first past the post. And actually, again, you know, with um, the informal uh, arrangement with the DUP previously. Um, and so, and I think that's really. I think getting under the skin of that is really interesting because the way coalitions are formed in a lot of countries which have PR is a lot more transparent in the sense that there are allegiances before the election, you know, voters go in sort of knowing if I vote for this party, well, they've been talking to that party. That often happens some places. Some countries it's more formalised than that. Some countries have kind of blocks where the same sort of parties always work together. Coalitions do form all, under all systems. What I think we've seen in the sort of coalition formation under first past the post is it is as you uh, described there, where it is kind of backroom. It's all in a bit of a panic. We weren't expecting to have to do this. What do we do? We don't have the tools of coalition building to make this work. And it, and it does, <coughs> excuse me, it does feel a bit kind of random. I think it's more damaging to have coalitions under first past the post than it is under systems where you kind of either expecting that or the parties are expecting it, or at least they're kind of building platforms that overlap, that, that kind of work in that way, because that gives the voter much more notice of what's gonna happen um, in advance. Um, and, it, and it does make it more transparent. Um, and I think for countries that have had PR for a long time, those, those links are actually really very transparent indeed. Okay, thanks, Jess. Jenny Budden, your question about First past the post, MPs. Jenny? Yes, thank you. Um, first, uh, take back control had such resonance in 2017. And we are supposed to be the mother of parliament. So this is interesting why this happened. I wonder if you could comment on whether safe seats actually make um, elected politicians of all parties complacent in a way they wouldn't be if under a PR system. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, I don't know in, 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 if I can maybe just ask you to elaborate a little bit, Jenny, on, on in what way complacent. Do you think not, not expecting, you were talking about take back control, do you mean not expecting the referendum result or kind of not responding to people in, in a way that you'd expect? Um, I wondered why voters were so taken up with taking back control. Why do they feel they need to take back control? Also, I've lived in a safe seat all my life until the last four years, and I now live in a highly marginal seat, and I see how much work goes into trying to maintain that seat. Um, you've got red wall for Labour. Why was it that people didn't recognise what was happening You've got Amersham and Chesham for the Conservatives. And it just strikes me 
I just wonder whether or not the safeness of the seat means that politicians stop listening. Thank you. I, I agree. In some cases, not really uh, sort of trying as well in the sense that, you know, un under systems where anyone could win, you know, people do put in the effort. And, and I think I think you're right in that. Um, we did a little bit of research um, one election to see how much election literature people were um, receiving in marginal seats compared to safe seats and it was like double the amount and some people in marginal seats were getting like 10 plus leaflets on a regular basis you know they've the election's really happening for them and then for people in the safe seats it's, it's barely sort of happening at all and I think I think that is a sort of that I think the complacency comes when it's kind of an assumption, this is our area, you know, this area always votes this way, that that's in the bag. And I think, as you rightly say, that's tripped people up. Um, and in a sense of take back control, I think there is a sense for people if they feel like their area is being ignored or taken for granted that, you know, referendums in the past have given people that one shot to say, actually, no, I'm really annoyed. Um, and, and you know, this this always seems a bit kind of a dysfunctional way of going about things. Um, but yeah, I think I think your assessment is, is pretty spot on there. OK, I'm going to now move to a few tactical questions uh, sort of on the way to get uh, uh, proportional representation, and I appreciate uh, if, if Jess, if some of these things seem sort of too partisan, that's okay, we'll understand that. Uh, and of course, the first question to pop up involves one Nigel Farage. A question from Stephen Cook, he asked me to ask, could working with Nigel Farage help the case for PR? He's anti-first-past-the-post, apparently. He turns my stomach, but needs must, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, I think, yeah, PR is an issue that doesn't just affect parties on one side of the political spectrum, of course. And, well, I mean, Nigel Farage has a number of different parties, but, but UKIP <clears throat> were very badly done by in, in the past. Um, and and they certainly um, did talk about the um, electoral system. But excuse me, sorry. <coughs> um, at the moment, I don't, <clears throat> it's, it's hard to see. Where, where the where the party is going well certainly UKIP doesn't exist anymore so the PR isn't something that's just for people of some parties it is we do have to be across the political spectrum because it's about voters of all parties and it's about voters of the current governing party as well because of course you know that's not going to be the situation for forever um, and that's why we work cross party because at the end of the day it's about voters whatever whatever party they vote for. Okay, next question um, from uh, Richard Godfrey. Richard, these are like tactical questions on the road to getting PR. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what struck me recently was the coverage that Dawn Butler got when she stood up in the House of Commons and called Johnson a liar. Um, yeah, with the obvious results maybe a way of raising the profile of PR is to plant questions from Lib Dems, Labour, whoever, on PR to Johnson. Um, we can phrase them in such a way that he's bound to lie. I mean, he probably lies without our help. Um, having done that, uh, we can then, we, um, members in the House of Commons, can stand up and call him a liar. Controversial. So, um, yeah. So, should should we be planting? Should we be getting MPs to to ask questions? Um, yeah. Yes, but also I don't. I think we know what his position is, um, and and I think there's probably you know um, limit. You know, in terms of parliamentary time, kind of limited scope to to. To get to get um, to get something that's not not on the table already, you know, and I think I think there's a job first to to move the issue more into the, the current debate um, because you know I think those opportunities at PMQs are really reserved for kind of the, the moments that are to, that are topical. So 
Um, I think we've got a while to go before we're kind of parliamentary strategy sort of territory. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question um, from Alison Kinsey. Um, uh, it's a two part, can we lobby Labour MPs? Is your list of, of MPs who support PR and who doesn't? Yes, there is a list on the uh, Make Votes Matter site. These the lists are not all completely up to date. Uh, there's ones being um, uh, calculated and they'll have a final list in, in September, but can we lobby Labour MPs to in fact support PR? How would we do that? Yes, that activity is happening and, and there's lots of different ways and different groups are, are doing it and, and, and helping coordinate that in, in, in different ways. But of course, as a constituent, you can always lobby your MP, you know, anytime you want, right? Just as a constituent. So, um, so yeah, a, a lot of conversations happening um, with, with parliamentarians from, from different groups and, and that, that's, um, that's an important part of the conversation. And the more people who want to lobby their MPs about it, the better, I think. Okay, Mary Southcott, you're a member of Labour Campaign for Electoral Reform, uh, Labour for a New Democracy. What kinds of, what is your view on what needs to happen uh, for, for PR to get more in the face of, of uh, Labour, the Labour Party? Um, I think that um, we need to take the argument further out um, to safe seats and northern seats and trade unions. Um, we, I'm in the southwest and we've already got a lot of uh, motions going to conference this year. And we had a discussion about it yesterday with trade unionists in the region. And um, they haven't had enough conferences to change their minds, especially the big trade unions. So I don't know what will happen at conference if, if conferences split um, between constituencies who are in favour. It's now estimated 83% of Labour members are in favour. That's a huge majority. Um, but I, I think that because of COVID, we haven't had enough union conferences to get them to change. Some of them are like juggernauts and they um, only move um, slowly because they have to consult their grassroots and they have to get their uh, executive committees online. And, and some people like staying with the past and are quite conservative. I'm not, I'm not um, blaming the trade unions, but I think that um, we need to give them a chance to catch up with the constituency Labour parties. Okay, do you have any response to that, Jess? Yeah, I mean, Mary's such an expert campaigner in this area and, and absolutely nails it. The, the constituencies are one part of the Labour Party and the unions have a huge voice and we're doing a lot of work trying to um, trying to, to, to move <laughs> to people to, towards that position. And you're right in the timings. Um, are very, very tricky because, of course, the, the, the unions are making their policies um, at different times. So um, a huge part of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, thank goodness we also have people like Mary who have been campaigning on this for so many years and, and know these issues inside out. I feel like Mary should have answered the previous question about lobbying Labour MPs, actually. <laughs> yeah, OK, good. Uh, let's go to some more questions now. Um, uh, Stephen Cook asked me to ask his question. How would PR work with the Lords? We would have a PR lower house and the ridiculous Lord still. Uh, it would be, you know, appointed, you know, uh, on the one hand and the other hand, a, a de much more democratic house. Would this, what would this, what do you think might happen from that, uh, Jess? Yeah, to have one and not the other. I mean, our view is that you need to reform the Lords too, right? And, and that needs to be democratic and, and elected and elected on a PR system as well. So, um, I mean, yeah, to make the Commons more democratic and then leave the Lords where it is, is not an ideal situation for our democracy either. I think the two, it's two sides of the same coin, isn't it? And I think reform in both areas is, is, is important and, and linked. Okay. Um Alison, could you ask your question uh, about this question of the current culture encourages conflict rather than consensus? Uh, 
I may, may have asked the question, how does first past the post encourage conflict rather than consensus? Do you want to add, add it to that, Allison? Uh, not really. I was just um, concurring with what Stephen had said previously about the way that first past the post creates a culture of conflict and the way that they argue across the house and all of that. Whereas I feel like if you have PR, you get more of a consensus politics and find common ground. Right. Do you have a comment on that, uh, Jess? Yeah, absolutely agree. And, and and part of it, I think, as well is having the tools of, of compromise and negotiation. And those aren't bad things. Those are quite useful political tools. And, and, and I think we saw this, I really felt we saw this um, in the Brexit deadlock where, you know, it was it was clear that something needed to shift and yet everyone was sort of like stuck in aspic in their kind of re represented positions and, and kind of you felt like you needed the tools to get out of that which are negotiation and compromise and, and and trying to find consensus and I felt like those those skills were really lacking in that moment and I think you're right that different systems allow those cultures to develop um, and so you can tr find common ground where where perhaps initially it doesn't appear to be any. Right let's just go now to a question sort of most people are not asking their questions as questions. They're sort of making statements, which makes it a little bit hard. Um, uh, it, it, but Stephen asked the question that, well, not a question, made a statement, that first past the post forces internal big party coalitions. Um, could you expand on that, Stephen? Or I take it you think that's a bad thing or a good thing? Um, yeah, I, I just think that when you look at the state of UK politics and you look at the, the issues going on in the parties, we see, let's say, my former party, the Lib Dems, we've got social liberals and economic liberals. We see the Labour Party with socialists, social democrats, centrists. We have the Tories who really have expunged their, their, their One Nation Tories and have now completely moved to the right and become blue kip. And it, but it just seems that in actual fact that the, I think the, the coalitions that we've formed have set us, in, set us in, in situations where we've become very tribal. And in fact, there are greater agreements between say social liberals, greens and eco-socialists than there might be between, within our individual parties. And, we, and if we had PR, it would actually break down and restructure British politics for the better. So, so I don't know whether that's a question or a statement. <laughs> would, would you agree, Jess? <laughs> I, mean, I definitely want to avoid um, predicting the future. Obviously, in PR systems, you do tend to have greater parties. And I think you can see how holding together different coalitions under one banner within a party is, is challenging. Um, and you can also see, I think you alluded to it there when you were talking about where the Conservatives have gone. People worry about small parties that represent a fringe of opinion. But if that exists within a party, what it does is steer the whole party towards that opinion or, or, or you have a party government that's moving towards where they see a threat on the outside. And so, you know, I think some of the worries people have around how party systems might change um, when you actually look at how things are operating at the moment, it seems seem far less worrying. But of course, it is something to consider, you know, when we're talking about persuading politicians, the idea that everything's going to break up and change is probably not that appealing. So, you know, it's it's kind of getting that balance. But I think you're right in the sense of, you know, that the, the, the situation at the moment feels a little bit dysfunctional. OK. Um... I think, I do, as I said, there's, there's some questions that I know that um, Jess wouldn't really be able to answer. I will answer one or two of them myself. There's one, there's this question, it's sort of a general question really about that there are a number of groups around uh, organizing for PR, probably the three best known are Make Folks Matter, uh, Labor for New Democracy, and Get PR Done, Labor Campaign for Electoral Reform, uh, there, you know, four, that's four. There, there are also other groups like the Chartists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And someone asked the question, what is the difference between 
Make Votes Matter and Get PR Done. Um, well, Make Votes Matter is a, a, uh, an organization that existed for about five, five six years. Um, they're an organization that's got quite a large budget. Uh, they have full-time staff. They do a lot of, of very good work. Um, Get PR Done is only existed for a year and a half. We're an all-volunteer group. Um, we have no staff, no back office, and no money. Well, a thousand pounds, but no money, serious money. Uh, we're an all-volunteer group. We do an awful lot. I think most people recognize we are sort of the leaders in social media um, work uh, in terms of blogs, in terms of memes, in terms of messaging. Uh, that's what we spend a lot of time on is trying to develop theoretical articles about PR, about Ian did one, for example, on the 2011 referendum. He's doing one on New Zealand. I've done one on how the, the two-party system is a duopoly and why. Why is it that in fact, it's not just a coincidence, for example, that there's never been a, 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 a party other than two that's won in the United States since 1850, in Canada, where I'm from, since 19, 1867, or this country since 1920. You have to understand the structure of, in fact, first past the post. So the groups, we try and we're members of um, the Labour for New Democracy have good good relations with Make Votes Matter. And I know Make Votes Matter has a big events across the country um, on, on Saturday. Some of numbers of people in our group will be participating in that. So uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if if uh, if someone wants to ask a question, is it would it be a good idea to have one big organization? Uh, do you have any views on that, Jess? I think it's important to have lots of different voices um, saying different things, working in different ways, um, you know, and, and sometimes having I work on policy. Right. And so you try and get different groups together with different policies and you go, oh, this is, uh, you know, you, you can waste time. You know, we, we, we should all be doing what we're doing and talking to each other and supporting each other. And, and, and I think that's working um, pretty well. OK, uh, I'm thinking I like Helen's comment, by the way. Pro Pardon? PR ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I, I, I'm just not trying to get into questions about internal politics or the <laughs> Labour Party. I mean, that's not Jess's a thing. Uh, or you know, talk about the Lib Dems and the Conservatives or the Coalition or about Brexit, all this kind of stuff. Um, I, I think we, unless there's any last-minute questions, there's a few more coming up. Just a second there now. Um, okay. Um, I'll just ask this question. What's the tangible difference between STV and London's supplementary vote? Oh, well, they are worlds apart um, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of how the vote's distributed. Um, SV kind of tries to get you like a, a majority, whereas, you know, STV, multi-member constituency, preferential system. So you get first, second, third choice. Um, so, yeah, both sort of... Uh, yeah, but both in the, the same ballpark, but at different ends of it. That is a terrible way of describing it, sorry. <laughs> but, but different systems for sure. 